Hey, this is Frank. You're listening to an Origins episode of the Unbecoming Platypus podcast. Do you ever feel like you have friends who sometimes just don't get each other? This is a podcast that I recorded with two of my friends, Jake and Noah. We find out the hard ways we struggle to communicate better and sometimes succeed, but sometimes not. For years, the three of us have talked about communication and how it's sometimes easier said than done. Even when we're trying to be understanding, our well-meaning intentions often get lost in translation. We decided to share these conversations with the world. Join us as we find out what happens when three friends try to learn how to really talk to each other. What did uh, what did you guys do last night? We watched the show. We made some meatloaf. Sort of binge binge watch the, the show Breaking Bad. Yeah, we watched the last three episodes to get that thing finished. Nice. Oh, you got it finished. Yeah. Is uh, Better Call Saul, is that like the sequel to that show? Yeah, you haven't seen that? No, have you ever watched it? Incredibly good show. Okay. Are you intending to watch that next? Is it yes. a, I'm hopeful. Is it after the events of Breaking Bad, or is it just about Saul's life? Like, is it... At any point, does he change his name to Paul? To Paul? Does he get a Does he have like a, you know? I don't think Jesus it's. Experience? No. Oh, okay. But I just don't, don't know. Anything there are both show. parts after and before. Oh, really? Okay. That's interesting. I loved Breaking Bad. I've never seen Better Call Saul before. Do you remember at the end of Breaking Bad where he says he's at the vacuum shop or whatever and he's like, I'm hoping I'm a Cinnabon manager in Nebraska or something? To Walt, um, in a couple months. I don't remember that specific line, but that's a key segue. It's what happens next. Oh, nice. That's pretty cool. Huh. I've heard good things. I've just never. What's it on? What platform is it on? Netflix. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I watched Breaking Bad probably ten or twelve years ago. Mm. Uh, watched it straight through. I think I got into it during the fourth season. Are there five seasons? You just watched it, man. Yeah, you literally just finished it. I just watched it for three months. <laughs> um, by pushing play on the next part. Oh, okay. I think there are five seasons. I think I... I bet we have Google. I have no idea what that is. Um, <clears throat> I think there are five seasons. Or four seasons. Five. There's so I started watching the show when the fourth season was airing. So I binge watched, you know, one through four. I think the final three episodes of, of season four or something, I, um, you know, watched as they came out. And then, you know, season five came out like a year later or whatever. And I don't know why, because I loved that show. I couldn't get enough of it. I could not watch it again. And and I couldn't pick up season five just <clears throat> out of nowhere. Like I I had to you know I didn't have enough background. I had no memory of what happened. Sure, I've, I've never tried re- rewatching it, but I'm sure that I could get back into it. I think I could now, yeah. but like a year later, I I wasn't in a place where I was. Well, I watched, watched with Randy and Frank for 20 minutes yesterday, and I was interested. I remembered enough to. I even I, remembered that Hank got killed, which. Don't, Don't say, say that. that. I was surprised uh, that I'm I going to give it away for everyone who's never won Breaking Bad and yeah. is dying to see it. All two of them. Apologies. They don't have access to it. Apologies. Yeah, my problem is that I just, I don't know. When I have free time, I do not watch shows. Mm. And, and I, sometimes I have the best of intentions. I jump into a show. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to watch the whole freaking thing. And then yeah. you know, three episodes and I lose steam. I don't have, right now, I don't have any uh, streaming services at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do have access to a friend's Disney Plus. Okay. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't watch that much TV, but when I am bored, I have recently restarted Alias. Oh, yeah. On Disney Plus. That's weird. Man, it's so long ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we were, uh, you and I went to 
bar yesterday and I looked up at a screen and Jennifer Garner was on the screen and I was like, is this alias? Mm. But she looks exactly the same as she did. She She's just, you know, no purple hair. Or whatever. For sure. Well, she only had purple hair. I know I the episode. I just watched it. Oh, episode six, season one. Well, it was part of the marketing for the whole show because I saw it constantly. Yeah. I mean, that was back when I was watching actual shows on ABC and uh, right. you know, the commercial would pop up. I, I, was, was that Fox? I, I, that was ABC, I think. I, 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 I almost asked you out of nowhere yesterday um, about what I watched. You watched <clears throat> you watch Lost? No, I never did. I don't know why it popped into my head, but I was just curious. Uh, I was thinking about Lost, and it was such a good show. Yeah, that, that was, was one of the shows that I remember. Like you couldn't wait for the next episode to come out the next week, right? Uh, and that's an experience that doesn't happen. Well, there are shows that release uh-huh. weekly. But people, I think a lot of times just ignore that and then binge after they're out. Sure. Yeah. Um, but back in the day, it was waiting for the next episode. And that was really big, you know, back in the Friends days. Sure. Like, wait, can't wait till next week to see what happens with Ross and Rachel or whatever. It's such an interesting uh, ju- juxtaposition from where we're at now. That is really interesting that, I mean, you're right. Like, you know, Netflix came along and it was, you know, this whole idea of like binging the season really became part of the cultural consciousness. And it was just something that you did. Mm. But, uh, you know, and then I guess over the last year or two, I've started to see, you know, the uh, releases of episodes weekly again, even though it's on a streaming platform. Well, we had that with Game of Thrones. We used to get together and watch that. That's That's true. Um. In that that was in the streaming era, so it does happen. But yeah, yeah. that used to be the that's was how it happened back in the day. It, for everything. It is interesting though, like thinking back to that that time period of you know Lost and Alias and stuff, and you had uh, twenty four, and I mm-hmm. love the idea of twenty four because it was like, you know, it was actually using the format of a typical season of a TV show. Um, you know, it, it utilized that and harnessed it and made it into something yeah. cool. Jack, Jack Bauer did a lot in the 24 hour period, though. <laughs> yeah. No uh, doubt. Sometimes uh, in multiple countries. I don't know how he did it. It was insane. But I, I, I got really into 24 for a while. Yeah. I watched like three or four seasons. I don't I know mean, if the multiple countries is actually true, but it seems true. Oh, oh I'm sure it is. Yeah. I'm, yeah, he got there, I'm sure. Somebody was on their way to another country. Either way, I remember one season. I think that Alicia Cuthbert got like you know kidnapped and taken over the border into Mexico. Yeah, so, um, that you sounds know, right. I like I like Twenty Four a lot too. When I was when it was on, actually, I remember uh, the way that I watched it was to get uh, DVDs from the library. <laughs> I would get the DVD box set. That's such a Jake Tolbert thing. And watch it on my compact Sario 5000. So that was that was the way I watched it. That is, that's such a Jake Tolbert thing. <laughs> we we check out movies from the library. That's what we did. Mm. Or check out CDs. You could check out CDs. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. I, never, I never did CDs. No, I'm not saying you did. Yeah, I'm just saying. Did you know you could get books from the library too? Yeah, I knew that part. When I was uh, young, we used to go to the library like twice a week. This is how I met, I remember it anyway. But I feel like we were always at the library, and I was always renting the uh, the Star Wars VHSs to the point that I mean, I I think I wore them out. <laughs> Uh-huh. Like, it, you know, you knew exactly where the, the squiggles were going to be. Frank and I went and got a um, library. Joined the library. How do, I don't know. Membership? Why didn't you invite me? One time. He's like, when after. He oh, lived here a long time. But I already have one. After Frank moved here, he's like, I'm going to go to the library, get a membership. You want to come? I was like, all right. Gotcha. And then. In the most frank fashion, 
he got there and owed like hundred and sixty dollars <laughs> <laughs> to the Decatur Public Library. <laughs> Is, is this that. part of the Rolling Prairie Library system? Yes, I don't know. They're, They're connected easy. in some way, but it, it was the most frank thing. He got there. We we like we both were getting our membership taken care of, and then she's like, "Looks like you owe some money from like 2000. Yep. Those were the debit card roulette days. Oh yeah. Yeah. You'd go to the library and need a book, and they're like, Well, you have a fine, it's like 17 cents or something. And you're like, We're <laughs> <laughs> I just want to read this book. Dollar you know? <laughs> uh, uh, fifteen. I, I can't afford it, I guess. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, read the book. I remember, yeah. <laughs> I remember having like a uh, you know calling up Staley Credit Union and being like, "Hey, so I see that you put an overdraft fee on my account, but I mean, I I replenished it like you know two hours after it overdrafted. Just yeah. curious if we could, you know, take that twenty five dollar fee off. Yeah. It makes it look so much worse when it's own, when it's thirty dollars overdraft. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good old Kelly." Kelly. Kelly. That's Daily Credit Union. I had her email. I just emailed her when things weren't going my way. <laughs> Kelly. I'm having a hard time. Yeah. She removed a lot of overdraft fees in those days. That's funny. Kelly's very kind. Yeah. Okay. Overdraft fees as a concept are kind of horrible. <laughs> Hey, you didn't have enough money to pay for this, so we're going to take more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the beginning they weren't horrible, and they're they are required sort of incentive. Oh yeah. As a bank, you have no viability if everyone overspends. Sure. Yeah, it has to be done. I mean, what else are you going to? But now it's like you know, go and get an account, and they're like, hey, do you want you know six hundred dollars of overdraft insurance or whatever? Yeah, um, I don't get that. Like, what's the point? Do they only give that to people who are never going to overdraft? Yes. <laughs> okay. Probably. <laughs> yes, that's a credit problem. It okay. comes with a fee, different different fee. You don't go negative. You just go into your line of credit. Sure, that makes sense. I get that. Huh? And then they charge you interest on that if it comes to it. Yeah. Oh, usually instantly. Really? No grace yeah. period on overdraft line of credit, usually. Interesting. <laughs> Frank, I, I love the robot face a lot. You're adding the conversation we're having right now to the agenda? Yeah. <laughs> Let me let me pop over here to the jam. Trying to help us keep on track. Filter <laughs> <laughs> ketchup. I prefer filter mustard myself. Talk about favorite shows and TV in general. <laughs> what do you guys, do you guys think, think about TV? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's a great idea. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan. So there's a time in my life I enjoyed movies. Hmm. I I can't watch movies anymore. Like I could fall but... asleep twenty minutes. Yeah. Uh yeah, I'm I'm like that mostly. I do have time. When I have free time, sometimes I will go back and watch something. I watch the First three John John Wick movies since there's a fourth one now. There's three there's four of them? There's one out in theaters now, I think. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Oh. And I've never seen John Wick ever. And I you know, I got have Google Play money that I can use. So I over the course of a few weeks I'd watch three John Wick movies. Lots of people die in those, man. 
Yeah. Is that the one where he goes to hell? What kind of murderers would you say they were? Well, I don't know. Jake would have to answer that question. Jake well, is uh, I don't another type of murderer since the last time we talked. They are dangerous. They are robbers in general. They are, you know, these like bad sort of ideas. If this person is walking up to your house and knocking on your door, they want the worst for you. They're going to try to hurt you or something like that. If that is the symbol that your tribe passes down to you, then you be- you believe that this thing is as dangerous as a bear and you would shoot them because you think your life is at stake. Mm-hmm. So, so I we were having conversations about different morality systems. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the questions though was was like it, essentially we started talking about this idea that um so we're talking about this idea that you know the closer a relationship that you have to a person, if I walk in and I see Jessica about to stab a person, well, I know her very well. I've known her for a very long time. I, I'm not going to try to stop her because because I'm going to assume you know that she's sort of an extension of my consciousness. I know that she would not be doing this unless it was. It was necessary in her mind. Would you not want to stop her from the standpoint of you don't want her to have to live with having killed someone? Potentially. That's, I don't, I think that in that moment, there is a very quick sort of, uh, you know, decision matrix that happens. You're, You're not going into a lot of details. It is react or don't. This is sort of why I don't like this conversation. Because it's just always that. It can all, it's always, well, I think it, it's going to depend. It's going to depend. And then it just gets broader and broader sure. and broader. And so that's why, like last week mm-hmm. or two weeks ago, whenever that happened. Uh, that's why I was like, I just don't feel like this conversation is super helpful to what our topic was. Yeah. I'm not saying right in this moment. Sure. But, but that's why I don't love that conversation because I agree with you. Yeah. I don't think you're wrong, but it, it just That's always gets broader because you can always say, well, it depends. It depends on the person. Do I know the person? What's happening? You're going to make a decision in the moment. And then all of a sudden, like your parameters continue to widen. Absolutely. Yeah. So. I think what I think, you know, just to close it out, though, the question that you asked that I thought was really interesting was something like, you know, what if Jessica was going to kill Thatcher? And then I said, oh, or, you know, what if Thatcher was the one with the knife? Mm-hmm. Like, what what are the different responses here based on the closeness? You know, if this is uh, my son, sure. am I going to stop it? Uh, it? It it changes based on who the person is, for sure. Exactly. How will you know the person? Uh, I like, like for, for the listeners out there, <laughs> we have... A Google Meet open, and all of us are different um, filters, mm. are using different different filters. And then Frank has been responding via emoji. Oh, no, I'm not actually using a different filter. I actually do have that octopus sitting on my head. Oh, okay, guys. <laughs> but Frank, Frank has just been listening to the conversation and reacting via emoji that floats onto the screen. I thought the conversation was about emojis. That is a moving emoji. Did you see that? Yeah, they float onto the screen and then they float off of the screen. Yeah, Yeah, but no, I mean, the the thumbs up thing. Like, it started with the thumb not up, and then the thumb went up. Mm. It's an animated emoji. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What do you guys think about emojis? Man, that wasn't for us. We... We've We're talked to you. Know. <laughs> I like them. Here, here, here. Hold on, let me respond. <laughs> That's very. You, you look like you're very ponderous. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. It's the right time for that. <laughs> How are you feeling about this podcast today? <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think.
things that octopus hats are <laughs> pretty <laughs> solid. Yeah. Well, I actually look like a dragon, a baby dragon. Yeah. You, you said Spyro? Spyro? Dragon, dragon. Spyro the dragon? I mean, you've heard the name. I don't know what that is. It's a PlayStation game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that actually Spyro or is it just meant to look like Spyro? It's not Spyro. Okay. It's just one of the only cute little dragons that I know of. I mean, Spyro was purple. Uh, um, but yeah, I remember I had Crash Bandicoot warped on PlayStation, uh, the original. And if you put in a cheat code in the menu mm. of that game, it gave you a demo of Spyro the Dragon. Oh, okay. And uh, so that's the only thing I ever played. I never actually owned Spyro the Dragon. Gotcha. I've heard the name. I just didn't know what it was, but yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. He's pretty, pretty cute little dragon. Snorted fire and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so, so um, our recent conversations have been about Slack. Have been surrounding, for some reason, surrounding social media, communication, brand, branding to a certain extent. Yeah. And um, emojis are interesting. We, we talked a little bit about emoji use at work. Uh, a couple episode, episodes ago. And it's interesting because I remember a time, and we still are this way, you and I specifically, but I think Frank too. I, don't, I haven't had as many conversations about emoji for the break as I have with Jake. Jake and I have. We talk we, it's exhausting. almost constantly. That is so good. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember a time years ago when we would actually make fun of it like oh yeah oh somebody why would you stay why would you put an emoji in a text message mm -hmm. um i think that's interesting in and of itself because why did we feel that way and i think to a certain extent still feel that way we would not use emojis with each other for sure at least i mean not non-ironically mm -hmm. right right um, but I have come to use them regularly with like my girlfriend, okay. for instance, yep. and actually quite often. I like it because, I mean, we have a long distance relationship and our, all of our communication is virtual. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you're a little bit talked out. You know what I mean? Because all we can do is talk. Mm -hmm. And so emojis, I think, are a quick way for me to tell her I'm thinking about her or whatever. Yeah. Like it's, a, it's a very easy way. I can send her a kiss or something and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. Mm -hmm. um, and we use them a lot. We also use uh, GIFs, um, which is something that I never, I mean, I would have never done that in the past. But sure. Uh, and she sort of introduced that to me because, again, we're, we're in a long distance relationship. She's, so she would send me a GIF of a man and a woman kissing or something. Mm -hmm. And at first it was sort of weird to me. But then I just I realized over time she's just trying to say, hey, this is what I would like right mm -hmm. now with you. And so anyway, I think it's interesting to talk about emojis in the context of language. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you're a good, uh, person to bounce stuff off of because of, you have a background in linguistics and, and this sort of thing. So I was thinking about emojis as language specifically, not just mm -hmm. emoji use in social media or whatever. Um, so I guess I'll start by asking you is emo emoji use is, are emojis a language? That's a really interesting question. I like that question. Um, maybe, maybe. Can I give you a different question to start with? And you pick the one you like better? Sure. Are emojis somewhat different than, would you say, like Egyptian hieroglyphics in language? Hmm. I would give the exact same response to both the questions. Great. I um, one, one more. I'm not asking a different question, but one other thing. Um, I know this is a big conversation within linguistics mm -hmm. and i i recently heard um on uh, 
what's the podcast? Lexicon, Lexicon Valley. Lexicon Valley, this brought up briefly, and they, I'm just adding to the hieroglyphics question. They, yeah. they mentioned like uh, Chinese or something because they use what we look, what we see as symbols. Sure. Not necessarily symbols, but for to us, it looks like, oh, they're just using a bunch of symbols to talk. So I'm just going to throw that out there at, before you start talking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, when I hear that, um, the first thing that comes to mind that I would say is that what language is not? Language is not written. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's something that's really hard for Western society to wrap their heads around because we are brought up with written text alongside speech, uh, side by side from the very beginning. But when you actually look at language, it is, uh, primarily spoken. It, that's the way it began. It's been around for, from what we can tell, like, uh, 80 to 100,000 years. Um, written language has only been around um, for six to ten, I believe. Uh, so it's it's really hard for us to get our heads out of this space that says, oh, you know, this word that I'm looking at is an actual word, but it's it's not. So define language for me in a in a as yeah. brief a way as possible. Just like what's a a basic? If I needed to explain this to someone else, sure. I mean, it is. Um, it's essentially spoken, sim- spoken and shared symbol. Mm. Like, like that's what it is. If if we agree, you and I, uh, upon you know the term Bob, and uh, you know we say that this cup is Bob, then I say Bob, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Um, is a is a shared symbolic, um, verbal system. That said, language is multifaceted. It is going to have a grammar. It's going to have that lexicon, that that vocabulary that is shared. Um, it's going to have uh, all those things, but it's also going to have a shared pragmatic system. And that's probably the direction that we'll go um, whenever we talk about something like emojis. Is that you know um, we don't just speak with words we speak with our bodies sure. right if if i were to um you know give you a thumbs up here uh you would say oh that means this is good in other parts of the world a thumbs up does not mean that it means something entirely different right or if you see somebody giving you a thumbs up on the side of the road you don't think oh that person says good job uh, right. driving. that person wants me to pick them up and sure. give them a ride somewhere right it is this sort of contextual thing that we implicitly know this shared sort of symbol language that um you know changes uh, are you trying to hitchhike right now what's it mean right now i think you're saying good job uh, man that's that was great that's right um so yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you start uh, saying that language is not written then from that basis you you already understand um that that emojis are in a way, not a language. They're a part of a language, mm-hmm. right? Um, I asked you, I'm sure you're getting there, but I asked you the other day when we were in the gym working out, mm-hmm. I said, are emojis a language? And you said, yes. Yeah. In some in some form or fashion. We, we can get there. But basically, the idea that, that I'm trying to get at is that... Um, In and of themselves, they can be used like language in a similar way that uh, well or haha in texting can be used, mm-hmm. right? These are what linguists call uh, pragmatic particles, and they are ways of giving you context clues to the emotional state or um, or the intended meaning of otherwise arbitrary text, right? That's that's sort of the way that they're used. Um, that said, we can use emojis in a way that we can't use uh, LOL. If you 
wanted to text Amy and and you know give her a kiss, like sending LOL out of context means nothing, right? But uh, if you send her that emoji, the little heart lips, sure. uh, it means something else because it's it's actually it's got context ass. built in. So. Right. It's, it's an avatar of your face across the room, like sending a kissy face, right? Um, so it kind of evokes this idea that text is very much like spoken language mm -hmm. in that we're not writing an essay usually whenever we text, right? Um, if you look at, at modern text usage, you're going to see uh, sentence fragments. You're going to see um, a lack of uh, punctuation sometimes. You're going to see a lack of capitalization. These things are not parts of language that you're thinking about when you're speaking out loud. As I'm talking to you right now, am I thinking about the fact that that sentence started with a capital A? Absolutely not. I'm not thinking about where the commas are. Sometimes I might interrupt myself in the middle of the sentence. Um, you don't see that in a book or in academic literature or anything like that. You see this sort of prestigious, well thought out, you know, flowing, crafted, edited sort of prose. Whereas S is really bringing us back into the realm of writing like we speak. I think that emojis in a very similar way are allowing us to communicate. Um, you know, this is that Snapchat conversation that we were having, right? It's like, how do we communicate in a digital space by recreating what we could do in the same room together? Yeah. So in that way, yes, <clears throat> emojis are our shared language, but usually not between more than like two people. Is this something you had, did, did you cover this in school? Did they talk about this specific thing? Not, not really, no. Just out of curiosity. Um, um, do you know sort of the origin of emoji? I mean, I don't. I, uh, I don't either. Sure about it, but. Well, well, I, I just, just Googled it out of curiosity and I obviously I don't have enough time to do research to know what's completely accurate, but. The modern day emojis that basically say go back to the early or the mid nineties, like with chat rooms, of course, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you know, those were just uh using colon and, colon and parentheses or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um and of course they have over time gotten broader and better. But those were originally called emoticons. Emoticons, yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I forgot about that. So we went from like emoticons to emojis, and now we've got like bitmojis. Right. That's, 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 that's an interesting piece of it, too, is now we're trying to not just show a face. We're trying to show an entire almost personality and identity mm -hmm. in, in like a bitmoji. The origin of, I'm just reading this from the internet, the origin of emoji can be traced back to Japan in the late 1990s. The word emoji comes from a combination of two Japanese words, e meaning picture, and emoji meaning character. Mm. Hmm. And so that's, that's also interesting. I, I remember listening to a Brave New Work podcast where they were talking about emoji use at work. Yeah, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I remember them saying that some cultures are way more like, like cultures like, like Asian, mm -hmm. different Asian cultures are. Um, they expect emoji use at a higher rate, even like at work, for instance. Okay, it's like more a part of a culture. Do you know anything about that? Is how 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 or why that might be different from culture to culture? I, I don't know specifically, like I can't, you know, um, state any research about it, but I can tell you that, you know, the first thing I think about actually is like uh, tonal languages, mm -hmm. right? Um, in Mandarin, for instance, you know, the same word, he, is said, he, he, you know, like these different ascending or descending sorts of tones uh, can mean different words. And Oftentimes, like if you just look yeah. at the um, the distribution, like you'll find a high correlation of people um, 
like what highly skilled musicians with perfect pitch mm. because they're more in tune with um, pitch from a young age. Uh, it, it's actually providing utility for them to be focusing and, and giving awareness to changes in pitch. Sure. Um, so in a similar way, I would say that, you know, you are looking at these <laughs> written uh, graphics that are uh, symbolic, you know? Um, <clears throat> so in that way, you, you're probably more used to um, the written form embodying in some way the word itself mm. if that makes sense now going back to frank's question are hieroglyphs is that language or are those images so hieroglyphs are are interesting well um, i'm sorry to interrupt. i know you said that language isn't written mm -hmm. and hieroglyphs i suppose would be quote unquote written in yeah. some way but do you see a connection between the two Oh, absolutely. I see it in the same way that any uh, character can sound, stand for a, a unit of meaning, mm. right? Um, for us, you think about the letter A. It stands for a unit of sound. That sound in certain environments stands for a unit of meaning. This is like when I think about language, and I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but it's really interesting. It's a system of systems that build upon each other. We have within us the ability to make sound with our mouth. It's just based on the shape. So if I have my mouth more open and I just vocalize a sound, I'm going to get ah. Uh, and as I start to close my mouth, changing the shape of it, I'm going to get oh. Mm. You know, so at the back of the throat, I've got ah. Uh, and at the very, very front, when those, um, lips are almost closed you got ooh that's a vowel there's also you know all of these consonant sounds where we're actually closing the mouth a little bit we have voiced and unvoiced variants which basically means are my vocal cords engaged or are they not right so if these this is just the human ability to make sound the next system up is uh, phonology how do we turn those sounds into meaning mm -hmm. so for instance, um, you know, if, if we're talking about the word apple, right? You and I would pronounce it apple. Uh, the British would pronounce it probably something like apple. And we're changing that sound. Av and ah, they're both represented by this symbolic of A, sure. but they mean something different, right? Apple is not a word, so I'm going to assume they mean apple, right? Uh, but we can actually change the meaning of a word for instance if i say pen as opposed to pin right these are different things and all i did was change one sound mm -hmm. so that's phonology then we've got morphology and these are little bits that are like clumped together so um you know i can say the word tie you know what this means it's the act of you know tying laces together or something like that so tie is in itself a morpheme uh, it's also a word. I've got another morpheme, un. I can put un right in front of tie, and I put these two units of meaning together, and they mean the opposite of tie. Right? right? So this is what we do. We've got a uh, syntax on top of that, which means what order do I put things in uh, a sentence? Right? If I say, um, you know, I untied my laces, it means something different then my laces untied me right the order of these things matter sure. um so as we compound all of these systems together this is actually what is creating this matrix of meaning mm -hmm. that all humans over time share um, and i realized that like i said it was a big digression but when you're thinking about meaning making and symbol sharing there is a lot going on between us. So it makes sense to me that when we're trying to share something that is necessarily spoken for all of time, you see my face, you see my hands moving, all this stuff. It had to happen in the same room together when, when we're sharing it over vast spaces where we can't be together. 
we're going to try to recreate that because you can actually glean more information uh, than just the words at face value. Hmm. So when you put those words on a page, mm -hmm. you said language isn't written. I'm trying to understand the sort of how it changes. Mm -hmm. um, so if I put a, a sentence on a page, how is it different from the, the spoken sentence? As far as language goes, is, is that? Can you rephrase it somehow? Yeah. Language so, is written, for sure. Language is in its primary state form. And it is that. Historically it, was? It, if we look at the evolutionary arc of language, it has for all of time been oral. And in fact, for you, you were able to speak and understand language as a verbal process prior to being able to yeah, do the rest. Right. Historically. Right. The written word is a symbol for the spoken language. Yeah. And is not the language itself. It is a symbol that refers back to the language. And do you think this can evolve in a way that what you're saying may end up being incorrect? It's entirely possible that at some point it could evolve to that state if people no longer speak to each other. Or in a situation where um, you know, I'm born deaf, for instance, and we're using hand signs to be that language. But what I'm really trying to draw attention to is that for literate societies, when you grow up, it's very hard to think about language as this ephemeral sound that comes out into space and then drops out as soon as I say it. We think of it as this lasting concrete symbol that you can write down and hand to someone, but that itself is not language. Right. Well, and the, the place that I was actually trying to go with this, I think, yeah, is I'm trying to understand the difference between the language and the symbol of a language mm -hmm. and maybe what makes those things different and how, how different and how emojis you emoji use bitmoji use these things that are developing mm -hmm. when you put those on paper or on a computer screen for instance might make it closer to language than just the symbol of language it's because easier. now you talked about tone and, and, mm -hmm. and these things I think emoji brings us closer to being able to put that on paper. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what my question is exactly, but I, that's my thought process is that do emojis bring us closer to language being on a screen? I would say yes in every way. And this is sort of what I was getting at with, uh, with text as well. Is it's like, you know, we have gone from being an oral people if, if you look at the transcript for this podcast, you will realize that I just said half of a sentence, interrupted myself, and have probably done that like three times uh, in the last 30 seconds, right? This is how people actually communicate. We think about language as, you know, this sort of written, prosaic, well-formulated thing, but that is actually an artifact of literacy more than it is an artifact of spoken language. Mm -hmm. If you could not put it on a page, you couldn't take this paragraph and say, you know what, I think that would sound better here, right? It allows for this sort of retrospective and editing process. We didn't see things like um, a detective novel, which really requires you to have point A that is leading us to this big reveal because you, you needed to start with the reveal. And you had to work your way back and the brain typically just isn't capable of thinking about this and and capturing an audience in that way without you know being able to move those things around tactilely but um the point that i'm trying to make here is that you know text we have sort of allowed ourselves to be 
as lazy as we do when we're speaking. We like, you know, I mentioned the thing about no punctuation, no uh, capitalization, this sort of thing, maybe sending, you know, a few words with an LOL afterwards, just sort of these like pragmatic indicators of oh, what, you know, I meant that in a funny way. Yes. And yes, I think that what we are really attempting to do in this text space is different than what we're trying to do in academic literature. We're trying to recreate the room that you, that we're all sitting in right now, where you're looking over at me and, you know, and I wipe my head and you know that I'm warm and, you know, like all these things, we're trying to recreate that in a digital space. Yeah. I don't know. I think emojis do things that you can't even do in a physical space. They can bridge the cultural gaps. Yeah. Um, I've worked with developers in the past that I would feel way less able to communicate with if we were at to sit in the same room together. Sure. Uh, versus some chat, some emojis thrown in to get a clear understanding, like they're universally understood. Mm hmm. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah. In some ways, it's better than this other kind of language you're talking about. And that makes me think it's a language of its own. Well, this is sort of what I was getting at um, when Noah said the other day, I said, yes, it is a language. It's a language between you and them that has been agreed upon. And you might use, um, <laughs> you might use an eggplant and <laughs> me an eggplant with them. Like, what are you having for dinner? Eggplant. You used an eggplant with us, we think you meant something different, right? It's a shared sort of thing um, that could mean something different to, to different people. Um, but you all have sort of determined this is what these emojis mean. Um, well, yes. Yeah. I mean, eggplant's a little obscure, but everybody sure. pretty much knows what the, you know, the common ones are. Thumbs up and the celebration yeah. and, you know. There are, there are cultural differences that are sort of harder to bridge than just a really smiley guy with a thumbs up or whatever. You know, it's like, oh, it's like yeah, it's, it's happy. He liked what I did. That's yeah. good. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, and Noah and I were talking about this not so long ago, that it's sort of an ad hoc language, um, which happens. Uh, for instance, um often in in colonial situations or like in the slave trade you would have a lot of people in one place that might be from several different countries that spoke different languages and what would often happen in these places is you would get what's called a pigeon developing a pigeon language is essentially a language that is almost always started from trade different people interacting i need that fish that you're selling I have this uh, ceramic, uh, you know, let's trade. We have to be able to develop some sort of really, you know, tiny language to, to do that. Usually what happens is you've got one language called the lexifying language, which is where you get all your words, and another language that provides the sentence structure or that syntax. What order do we put them in? And then you take a few of these words, you throw them into there, and we're both creating this language together. And sometimes those languages actually stick around long enough to become real and in use. Uh, there's a Hawaiian uh, pigeon that has just become like a national language at this point. Um, and at that point, they're called Creoles, and they're actually solidified in, in time. That reminds me a lot of what you're talking about here with emoji use. It's like, hey, we're using this language for a time and space. I'm not going to pass this generationally to my kids. I'm not going to say, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> this emoji means this when you're talking to these people. Um, but it, it absolutely does bridge otherwise uh, sort of chasmic. Yeah. yeah, and also, and not even like major cultural differences, just personality differences. If I'm talking to an Enneagram 2 or a 4, uh -huh. I use emojis because there's no risk. There's like so much less risk that they will misunderstand what I mean. Interesting. So I just always use emojis. They're concise. They're clear. If I don't use an emoji, there's a chance that they think I'm mad at them or something. 
Uh-huh. Not yeah. just these specific types, but sure. they're the most common misunderstood, like misunderstood by me, I would say. Mm-hmm. Then I have a whole phone conversation, and maybe that's <laughs> 45 minutes long. And then at the end, they feel better. They don't know that, but I could have just put a little smiley guy at the end of the sentence, and they would have known I love mm-hmm. Why not just do it? Right. That is language. Absolutely. That it is replicating what you would have done in the same room with them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, except I'm probably better in the written word. Potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I I mean, that's that's sort of what I mean by the hieroglyph question. It's like, is an emoji and a hieroglyph, you know, the same thing? Yeah, they're pictorial representations of some symbol. The symbol still has to be shared, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and it primarily is. Uh, there was actually this study that was done a while back <clears throat> that looked at, um, you know, we talked about body language, but facial expression. And they broke uh, this down. They did, they did this cross-culturally. And they, you know, had these cameras, like, look at the micro-expressions of people. And they determined, you know, these different areas of the face. So you've got, you know, uh, brow growing, eyebrow movement, nose twitching. You've got different uh, shapes of the mouth, obviously, um, and even shapes of the eyes, how much they're open, closed, this type of thing. And they determined something like hundreds of combinations that the face can be in. And then they found these universal constants across every single culture that they studied. And these constants were uh, things like pain, disgust, anger, sadness. Across cultures, these all look the same and i think that that, uh, in that way that emoji really is communicating something that is beyond this oral language definitely and it's just human and did you ever watch lie to me yes i yeah. love that show that was great. it was all about um i don't even know what micro was. Expressions. it was about micro expressions but i don't know what like he he basically was a lie detector and he studied micro expressions to determine if somebody so like investigating for like law enforcement or whatever but it was super interesting i mean it was a tv show but it was still really interesting yeah Um, and you can learn a lot from it i mean i supposing that it's accurate but it was very interesting yeah the micro expression stuff is great yeah i mean if you know i said that language is you know in its primary state oral but uh there are obviously these other aspects or dimensions to language like body language. And if if I could take it back, I would say, yeah, I mean, the baby looking up at its mother's face uh, while it's feeding is probably receiving communication and she's receiving communication from it um, far before words mean anything else. Yeah. So there, there's this universal constant that we're, yeah. I mean, it's obviously missing in the written word. So being able to add it back is making it more like the real world. Yeah. I mean, I use emojis. Essentially, if I don't have a firm foundation relationship with someone, even in business, I use emojis. Mm -hmm. They just reduce the risk. And it's a waste of time and energy on my part to increase the risk that someone's going to misunderstand what I mean. Isn't that interesting? Because not so long ago, I felt like, the use of emoji was the most unprofessional thing you could do. And then yeah, I remember the trickling. being on the leading edge of that. I had mm-hmm. people say, don't, please don't do that. And mm-hmm. I said, no, it's just not worth it. Like I prefer to do it. So yeah, if it's something you need to fire me for, I understand, <laughs> but our customers really like me because I am clear in my communication. So mm-hmm. yeah. Balance the force. Right. But I know there are people who hate it uh, for sure. I don't, you know, if they make a comment, I don't know, I'll probably stop. Like, if the recipient is like that, why'd you put a smiley face on there? I'll probably stop. But sure, it's sort of person specific or audience specific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I especially learn like the people who emotions mean a lot to them. Mm-hmm. Like, they're really how they feel is important. Uh, a lot of people aren't that way, and a lot of people are. So. If I know that it's important, I'm like, I'm going to spend more energy on that part of the message. Mm-hmm. 
Because I just want to create an environment where people want to work where they want, they love what they're doing, and if right. they hate it, then they're never going to do it. So, I, I, this is, you know, totally different. I guess it, it's almost what workplace culture related, but it's like, I don't know if I personally have gone through this evolution or if work culture in general is sort of going through this evolution, or maybe it's both. But I remember, you know, in some of my first jobs, it felt so prescriptive. You have to dress this way, despite the fact that you would never dress this way any other time. You have to speak a certain way in your emails. You have to do it. You, you have to be something other than what you typically are. And obviously, there's, there's still some of that. You have to conduct yourself, you know, different in different audiences. But I do feel a lot more of what you're talking about, which is, hey, guys, I have this crazy idea. If we all just got to have fun and, like, feel motivated based on, you know, what motivates us individually, we would probably produce more and better things. I, I see that a lot more. And it's like, why wouldn't we use emojis? I mean, the emoji, like, at face value, I think. Um, is not <laughs> offensive. Right? I, it, like I, I guess, guess I understand that it looks different than academic yeah. writing in the prestige dialect or whatever. Um, it looks more like texting, which we feel is somehow uh, you know a devol a devolved form of good high quality language. But if we can actually appreciate the fact that. Texting looks far more like the conversation you're going to have across the boardroom table, um, face to face. It actually seems to me that texting, emoji use, whatever we're doing in that sort of familiar environment is is actually what we've been doing trade with uh, for all of our lives, uh, the life of of society, yeah. and closer to what we're doing. Yeah. So. It doesn't doesn't seem like a bad thing. I I do think it's funny though, like just to take it somewhere else. You you said this and you meant it in a different way, but you said um, you can do things with emojis that you can't even do uh, in regular life, right? And you were talking about you know talking to somebody who speaks a different language than you, but you recently discovered uh, the Bitmojis in Snapchat. And you and I were sending these ridiculous, stupid things, uh, you know, back and forth to each other. We're, you know, we're lounging in a bowl of ramen like it's a hot tub or something. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that art tends to go from realistic, think Rembrandt and, you know, the, the Renaissance and trying to replicate realism as much as possible. Some new technology comes in. Oh, we've got the photograph now. You, we don't need painters to do that. Uh, we can just click a button and we've got your exact likeness. Painters, you guys don't do something else. So painters go, uh, you know, like Dali, and they're like, all right, well, I want to paint horses with two story long legs and, you know, make us bend like soup. And uh, I see the same sort of progression here. It's like, the Bitmoji is trying to recreate emotion and, and context in a digital space. But then all of a sudden they're like, well, we could do crazy stuff too. Like, you know, take us all to outer space and put an octopus on Jake's head. Um, um, yeah. I, and Snap is like actually leading. Like, I'm very impressed. I don't open that app that much. But each time I do, they're getting smarter and better AI on the conversations. So that the, like, it literally is generating, I don't know what better, but very good, complex emotional responses to the context of the conversation. So you mm -hmm. can take whichever, you know, there's three choices there on which way you want to take it. And they're right. very human. They feel really human. I agree with that. I, no, I, you don't have this experience. I don't think they had this when you were on Snapchat. And you probably weren't using it this way, but like, if I type something to Frank that says, hey, I'm excited uh, to get going this morning, you know, it's going to show me like three pictures at the bottom of mm -hmm. a little Jake looking thing that, um, you know, he could be like saying, hey, 
Uh, no, it was it was doing that several okay. years ago. Yeah. Yeah, or you like, let's go on a run. And it's me and Jake running a race or something. You know, like <laughs> yeah, it, you're right though. Like it's it's getting very intelligent about what it gives you, and obviously this is probably just based on the way users use it. Yeah. You know, it's like hey, most hey, people when somebody typed lawnmower used this emoji, uh, you know, with it. So um, it, it starts, starts to create these very interesting. Um, like tangential relationships yeah. between emojis. I mean, I don't have an example right this second, but it's like that's so weird that that popped up. But it's kind of exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, well, it's building. They're building their own that, so right. of you, but of general language and yeah, they're. I mean, I don't know if those images are truly like random. I don't mm-hmm. think they're at that level yet, but I think they'll get there where mm-hmm. you can say, yeah, do you want to, I don't know, go canoeing on a lake? Uh, and it generates you two in a canoe on a lake. Sure. And it gener- and it uses the weather of your location. And yeah. you know, it, I don't yeah. think they're at that level, but I think they'll get there because just the trajectory they're on. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't see why not. And then, but you can't do like it would require so many words or so much back and forth communication to communicate how nice it is outside and that we should go canoeing. And mm-hmm. do you want to go? And then put this picture in your head, and or I can just and you're like, ah, oh, it does look really good. Let's do it. You know? Sure. That's a, that's a good point, actually. Um, that. That's funny because, you know, we had this conversation about how Snapchat feels the most human. And we decided that meant I it allows me to interact with a person who's far away from me the most similarly to the way I would interact with them in, in person. And taking this idea of, like, moving from uh, realism to surrealism, what Snapchat has also done is give us new reasons and ways to interact like i can't tell you how many times my son has been like hey daddy can we do filters on snapchat and we just sit on the couch together and make funny faces and like we're doing that together because of this surreal opportunity or you can do that you know if you and i were in different houses and use those filters we could send them to each other it's a reason to interact yeah well and there's a reason you probably haven't considered it that your French fries right now. Yeah. It's sort of fun. It is fun. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh. I am French fries. Mm. I can see posting this video. You know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should end the podcast. Does anybody have any last thoughts before we do that? I like French fries. <laughs> I don't really like French fries. Really? No. Not a fan of French fries anymore, mostly yeah. because of the fried. Yeah, no consensus on French fries, unfortunately. Cool, cool. Cool. Dragon out. Robot out. Bye, you later. Hey, it's Frank again. Thanks for listening to an Origins episode of the Unbecoming Platypus podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast to stay updated on future episodes. You can also check us out online at theunbecomingplatypus.com. We hope these conversations inspire you to improve your communication skills and deepen your connections with your own friends and loved ones. Until next time, this has been the Unbecoming Platypus podcast.